So I think it's good morning, everyone. So I'm Kuang. Um, so here's my presentation, Flux and an intro to GitOps. So yeah, so I'm basically a dev, DevOps and a backend software engineer. I <coughs> develop mainly on Django and Angular, and I contribute to the Malaysia land public transport community. So that's me at Shanghai two months ago. Yeah. Okay, so before I start my talk, a few disclaimers. First, I don't represent or work at VWOPS, which is the Flux, the company that does Flux. Uh, and I'm not a maintainer, I just contributed a few lines of docs. And views represented here of mine, and I'm still very a novice. So uh, these are presented best, accurate best to my knowledge. So if there's any discrepancies, uh, I stand corrected. So, um, yeah, let's first talk about Kubernetes in a nutshell. So, the typical way of thinking things in Kubernetes, as far as I know, is I don't care as long as. So, yeah, so I don't care where the storage is, as long as I have 20 gigs. I don't care how you schedule, as long as I have a pod that has so much CPU, so much memory. I don't care where goes where, as long as 10% goes here and like this. And the traditional way of doing things is usually kubectl, apply, and forget. So you create a YAML file and lint it. Uh, do you lint it? Uh, you run kubectl, apply, then you pray for it to work. Then you probably chunk the YAML file somewhere, uh, hopefully in version control, which I think, um, you know, as time passes, changes pile up. You start to ask yourselves and your teammates around, so this configuration exists in my version control, did I apply it? Uh, where did I apply it? Did I apply it in prod, staging, environment XYZ? When? And isn't this deleted already? Why is it still at this in version control? And then does this change reflect the cluster state? This is the most important part, is that I see this thing has CPU, uh, let's say 1000M, but actually in the cluster it has 2000M. Why it happens? No one knows. And then, you know, you spend time kubectl get in the cluster to validate above, but as um, if you are familiar with a kubectl get and uh, those status, those status maybe it, only the last five exist. So before that, nah. So the problem is, you know, we are putting too much trust on people. We say, okay, um, you should commit in source control after you did some changes, but uh, you know, I, uh, let me just fix prod first, and then I'll commit the change later. And then, hey, I did X, Y, Z, uh, right? Right? So, meet this company called Weaveworks. So, Weaveworks in year 2015, they launched this product called Weave Cloud to help manage clusters. And then, 2006, they break prod. Actually, it's planned. So, but they managed to restore it in 40 minutes due to this kind of good practices. And then in year 2017, they coined the term GitOps. So what are the core principles here? So the core principles is first is declarative, which means I don't declare what are the steps taken to achieve this particular status. I only say that, okay, I don't care what you do, as long as after 10 minutes, I want it to be like this. I don't care whether you delete ports, whether you restart the deployment, as long as after 10 minutes, this is what I want. The next is, of course, version and immutable. Everything is in Git, and the source of truth is Git. And yeah, let me just go back to this. And because, if it's, if it's, it, because it's Git, you get to see who did what change when. This is a very important thing, especially when you are in a larger-ish uh, company. And of course, for GitOps, changes should be pulled automatically. You should have an idea that says that, okay, this is accurate up to 10 minutes in, and if it's not, then after 10 minutes, this will happen. And of course, continuous reconsult. So there are multiple software agents that run continuously and saying that, okay, there's some divergence. So for example, you change a config map. So you change it and say, okay, uh, we are now on debug mode, but you shouldn't do it in production, right? So within your GitOps declaration, you say that, okay, debug mode should be false, and then after 10 minutes, it runs a reconciliation and, and says, hey, this shouldn't, debug shouldn't be true. So it, it reapplies the config and reverts the change. 
So all of this within 10 minutes. But um, 10 minutes is like the usual uh, reconciliation period, but of course you can change it 30 seconds if you want. Um, yeah, so meet Flux CD. So as you can see, Flux is a set of continuous and progressive delivery solutions that are, I would say, very open and extensible. And it runs using the GitOps Toolkit, uh, or GOTK, uh, pool-based pipeline, uh, more of that later. And it's a CNSCF graduated project, and it is released by Vivers. Ah, it's not V2. Okay. So what are the differences between the pool and the push pipeline? So push-based pipelines basically will expose credentials. So what are push-based pipelines? So if you guys are familiar with uh, GitHub Actions, or some of you use uh, Semaphore CI, or some click-based uh, CI tools, so basically what happens is that, okay, when I run this thing, before I run this thing, I will need to get the secrets from, let's say, a secret store. Hopefully you put it in a secret store. Uh, put in, uh, get from a secret store, and then you, based on that secret, based on that config, you apply it to your cluster. So the problem with that is actually, um, if let's say someone hacked into your CI provider, they can basically see your credentials. But, yeah, so it's a commonly known attack vector. So, but, for pool-based pipelines, on the other hand, it works within the trust domain. So what do we mean by that? So in the example of uh, Flux is that after 10 minutes, it pulls from the Git GitHub repository. So you can see that the GitHub repository does not have any uh, control, I would say control, over the cluster itself other than the declared files. So everything is run within the trust domain of the cluster itself. So the cluster controls itself and not anything else. So yeah, so the with GitOps pull pipeline is something similar. So we have this thing called the deployment automator. It watches the image registry, which is uh, something like a curl something version, Ubuntu something version, watch the image registry for changes. And then there's another thing called the deployment synchronizer. It watches the cluster to maintain its state. So like what I said just now, config maps that go out of sync, it will force sync it back. So the GitOps Toolkit or GOTK is actually a bunch of stuff there, but not to go into too details, uh, it has a source controller. It provides a very common interface for artifacts acquisition. So basically it manages uh, Git repositories, uh, OCI repositories, uh, buckets. Yeah, you can use buckets. So as long as it's a source, it manages it. And then the other thing is the customized controller. So I'm not sure how common customized is, but uh, it's like a Kubernetes specialized operator, it runs CD pipelines, and then assemble with this tool called Customize. And there's another Helm controller. So uh, one thing about uh, Flux is that it is very uh, centered around both Customize and Helm. So everything within it runs on Customize, and Helm is basically the first class citizen there. So it allows you to declaratively manage uh, Helm chart releases. So anything you want towards Helm, you just write it in a, within a YAML file, and they will apply it for you. And also notification controller, which is something a little extra, is that if there is any changes towards your cluster, it just uh, notifies you. So it can be Microsoft Teams, it can be Discord. So it says, OK, I deleted this resource within this particular uh, commit, and the reason why, and so on. And also another thing is the image uh, automation controller. So this is quite interesting, is that it monitors a repository. So like for GitHub repositories, it looks and sees, okay, the latest release is like uh, version two. So it looks at version, looks at GitHub and says it's version two, looks at your configuration, your configuration, says, your configuration says version one. So it will automatically open a new branch and then uh, submit a pull request. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, those seniors and anything, they can just see, okay, this is good, much. Okay. So um, this looks a little uh, wonky. So how a commit cycle works is that uh, first we need to know that uh, Git is always the source of truth in this case. Um, so um, let me see if we can zoom in. Okay, there you go. So first thing, of course, uh, for a Git repository, you push it always, then the Flux controller will pull from the Git repository, then it builds an artifact. So after that, it will, um, it will generate the status and says that, okay, what should I do about it? 
and it will look at the Kubernetes API server, and then um, you know API server will notify a new revision, fetch artifact, blah blah blah. <coughs> and also one thing that you can see over here on step nine actually is the ability, not ability, like the feature to decrypt secrets. So when we are working on a GitHub, GitOps repository, right, we tend to commit secrets in. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people may probably will say, oh no. Why do we commit secrets in? Uh, we don't actually. So for my situation is that I use this thing called a sealed secret. Yeah, or Mozilla SOPS. Uh, so we use cube secret, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we use sealed secrets. So sealed secrets basically has a master key. So that master key will encrypt all of the secrets that we can ultimately commit into our source control. So in the end, you can have a track record over your secrets, but you don't expose it. But in the end, um, you know, you still need to secure your keys. Yeah. So after everything happens here, it will validate, it will apply. Then after that, if anything needs to be deleted, it deletes, wait for readiness. And then if it's ready, then it sends another uh, alert and everything. Lah. So yeah, so for reconciliation, for a commit cycle, Everything runs within this particular turn. And yeah, like what I said just now, there's a little bit of extras uh, called image update automation. So what happens is that it automatically creates a branch. As you can see, this is uh, my personal project here. Um, it, cre yeah, it creates a branch. So as you can see over here, it, it merge, merge, merge. And then suddenly a new revision happens. Version 135 happens. And then it will go for a prod and a staging. And then whether I decide to merge anything, then I decide. So um, the reason why image update automation is viewed as an extra, because during your setup, you actually have to send in an extra flag. So that's why I put it as an extra. OK, so next, uh, in our production. Yeah, so in our production, Let's first talk about our scenario. So our product is called TalkUp. It's a CRM that serves customers uh, mainly in Southeast Asia. So for usual deployments, a Semaphore CI pipeline, which is a click-based pipeline, is invoked, and then we apply Helm charts. So the way we apply Helm charts is that we take a look at the deployment repository configuration, and then we apply it, and that's it. There's no tracking. There's no nothing. We only know that um, this particular revision has been applied, but when? Um, no tracking. So um, for, for our most utility applications, luckily, are already deployed using Helm charts. And we have just two Kubernetes clusters, production and staging. And you know, 24-7 availability, availability is required. So we have this requirement. It means that we are basically changing wheels on a moving vehicle, as you can see there. So how do we migrate? To migrate to Flux, of course, uh, we need to create a new cluster, which is a test. We test everything there first. Uh, I think I broke it three to five times. And then after that, in staging, I installed the Flux controller and GitOps toolkit first. So anything, I can just directly modify my uh, GitOps repo, and then it will reflect back on that cluster. So for that's uh, why I say just now that we are lucky that we are already doing Helm charts is because when it detects that it's, it, it is Helm, and then when we uh, declare it in the GitOps repository, it automatically take over. So there's no downtime, there's no nothing. The only thing that happens is it will apply a label saying that, okay, this is now managed by Flux. And that's it, so there's no downtime, there's no nothing. But remember to lock your versions. Lah. Okay, and then after that, um, the seal secret controller is added first so that we can start committing secrets. And then, yeah, like I said, anything managed by Helm taken over, remember the log versions. And this is very important, is that the declarations, remember to add it according to namespaces. Because as far as my experience goes, it uh, takes over the entire namespace. So, and yeah, worth noting, it does not delete existing resources that are not declared. So what happens uh, during our testing is that, okay, we have some things that are declared uh, within Flux, and for some things, we open a namespace just to test it out. And we were wondering, 
why, why did the new resources didn't get deleted after 10 minutes? So after investigation, turns out Flux probably uh, takes over according to namespaces. So as my boss says, do you have any metrics? What happens is we have around 100 times speed improvements on cluster recovery time, um, which may be larger for clusters that are more complex, but our one is very simple. So since the introduction of GitOps, the cluster recovery time reduced from about three days to about 40 minutes since we just bootstrap everything and then that's it. And then we can be pretty sure the cluster is in the state we want it to be, which is working. And this is very important to me and also very close to my heart is that we can now democratize cluster management. So when you are a junior developer going into the company, boss says don't touch my cluster, right? Don't touch my configuration. Um, I'm two years in the company now, boss, if I'm seeing this, I still don't have, don't have access to production. Yeah, so <laughs> um, we can democratize cluster management by involving juniors without being scared that our clusters will randomly explode because anything that is happening will need to go through that Git uh, tool chain. Anything, any change they want to do needs to go through a pull request. So they can actually bootstrap their own cluster, link it on the link it on the images or link it on the declarations that let's say production uh, staging has, replicate it to, your, to their own laptop and run the changes there. And once they are really sure, they just run a pull request. And then for the juniors is that, okay, la, if my senior pass it, they pass this, it's not my problem anymore, right? Okay, so throughout this, uh, lessons learned. We actually should have started way, way, way earlier because uh, our staging actually broke twice. The first time, uh, I think my senior used three to five days. Second time is three days. So yeah, the earlier you incorporate GitOps, the better, the, the, the smaller the downtime. And yeah, this is also towards me. So when convincing your boss, try getting to the so what conclusion as soon as possible to let them have a very high level overview. So, in my own, in, in my circumstance here, the so what conclusion is that, okay, I can say my senior time from three days to 40 minutes, this is the so what. But I, uh, towards me, it's, uh, I took about one week to get to that conclusion, so blames on me. And also, when you are doing it, dig into the configuration as much as possible to reduce the discrepancies between the declared and the actual one. So some users' secret targets are ENV from or some manually pass once, especially like when you're setting up Elasticsearch, you basically need to pass in the uh, password in the Helm configuration. I don't know if it's fixed now, but yeah, it's like that, and we set, we set it up like that. So I broke staging once because of that, but I think that's a small issue. Lah. And yeah, don't worry if it takes 20 deployment cycles to fully roll everything out. Just make sure to be right on the first try. Don't break anything. Uh, yeah, another important thing is to install the Git, Git, with GitOps dashboard right from the start. So um, for Flux, it operates mainly using YAML files. So it's more catered towards operators. So this with GitOps dashboard thing basically is uh, open source official dashboard. So you can see, okay, what is being stuck where? So you just sort it out there and you'll be on your way. So um, before I get to my conclusion, I realize I have a lot of time, so I'll extra slide. So why Flux CD and not X, which I think many people are using Argo, right? So if you are familiar, the logos is Argo CodeFresh. So CodeFresh is basically Argo, but enterprise version. The, the one there is Flux, Vivox is enterprise version of Flux. Jenkins X, I think most of you heard it before. Wolf is also something similar. Okay, so why are we using Flux CD and not X, Argo? Yeah, so the reason why is that first we are using Flagger from the start already. So Flagger is actually, I would say, a traffic shaping tool. So let's say we roll out a new deployment. It helps us uh, do a canary deployment, which is like 10% towards the new, nothing happens, 20% and so on until 50%. So we figured that, okay, since both are from the Flux CD project, they should work well together. Should. Okay. And 
Flux is way more bare, bare bones than Argo CD for me. So for me, simple is better. And hence, uh, very, very much easier developer onboarding from the YAML side. So if you study normal declarations, normal CRDs, then it will be good for you instead of uh, clicking through the Argo uh, environment without knowing what you are doing. So um, in a nutshell, why GitOps? So this is like a takeaway-ish for your boss. So first, increase productivity, auditability, reliability. Um, it's better, and then you can trace who did what when. It's reliable because any, any changes or any weird changes you did will be rolled back within 10 minutes for plugs. Yeah. So very enhanced the plug experience, democratization of development. Anyone can try developing already. Very uh, much stronger security guardrails. So because you are going through Git, it means that you can restrict access towards the cluster, towards your juniors that don't know what they're doing because you just need them to access the Git repo instead of the cluster itself. And faster development, better ops, everything in YAML file. So there's actually an inside joke about um, DevOps is that we are actually not DevOps engineer, we are YAML engineer. Um, and then easy compliance and auditing. This is like obviously because you can see all the commits. And I think that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will take questions. Questions? No questions? Eh? Yes. Um, may I know why you use um, seal secret? I mean, there are other... Um... Alternatives. Yeah, alternatives. Um, because it's much, much more simpler, like I said. Because for Mozilla SOPs, you need um, some knowledge towards uh, your cloud provider is one. And for seal secrets, you just need knowledge of probably two things. One is the CRD for the seal secrets. And the second one is actually how to back up your master keys and where, when. So. That's the reason we went for seal secrets. So because our company is still small, so we don't want to invest so much developer time on it. So this is probably like the simplest way of all. Uh, but let's say you have like monthly um, password rotation, then... Uh, seal secrets does have its uh, own rotations. So um, yeah, true also, we can have monthly password rotations. I mean, all of those, you can just write a script to automate it, right? <laughs> So, any more questions? If no, then I think I'll end the session. Thank you everyone for having me here.